Tonight on Primetime Politics, pushing back on Ottawa. This isn't about denialism. This is about what is achievable. Alberta launches a campaign fighting Ottawa's proposed electricity regulations. Why is the province against net zero by 2035? And what would it take for Alberta to invoke its Sovereignty Act? Coming up, we will speak with Alberta Premier Danielle Smith and get our political observers to weigh in on the debate. Plus... You are the first black Canadian to become Speaker of this House. Making history and learning from a controversy that forced his predecessor to resign. Newly elected House Speaker Greg Fergus will join our program. This is Primetime Politics. Hello everyone, I'm Michael Serapio. By now, you may have heard or seen part of an $8 million ad campaign from the Alberta government. Its aim is to express their opposition to the federal government's proposed electricity regulations. It wants to make Canada's electricity grid carbon neutral by 2035, but that is a goal that the Alberta Premier says will make electricity unaffordable and unreliable for her province and for others. Take a listen to a part of their campaign. When Ottawa's proposed electricity regulations make electricity unreliable, the things you rely on won't work when needed. Your hot water, computer, washer and dryer, electric car, TV, lights, mobile phone, stove, your heat in minus 30. Well, we're now joined by the Alberta Premier, Danielle Smith. Premier, really appreciate you taking the time once again. Uh, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Listen, I want to begin our discussion today with the uh, electricity regulations, the ones being proposed by Ottawa, because you did turn to social media, and I'm going to read this uh, message out to our viewers, because in this message you say the following, it is time for the Prime Minister to side with Canadians instead of his, of his ideological environment minister. If the power goes out in minus 30 or plus 30, Albertans and Canadians know that won't end well. Why the choice of the word ideological in describing Stephen Goudbeau? Well, there, there's no other way to describe it. I, I've been talking with the, the Prime Minister since actually my very first conversation with him, saying that we were aligned on trying to get to carbon neutrality by 2050. I told him that we would bring forward an emissions reduction and energy development plan. We did in April. I said I wanted to establish a working group where we could align our various objectives. We did. We have a working group happening right now. And yet you have Stephen Gibault acting as if none of that's going on, that none of the, uh, the concessions that we've made and none of the approaches that we've made to find some common ground matter. And the, the real problem that we have in Alberta is that is the absolute reality, is that we are facing the potential already of having instability in our grid. And if we don't have a mechanism to bring new baseload power on, we're going to end up with the same problems that you see in Germany and California and Texas. And I just can't stand by and watch our power grid fail. Blackouts occur, especially in the uh, dark of winter and the heat of summer. And that's what we are trying to make the, uh, the federal government understand is we simply can't achieve the targets that they put out by 2035. We have to work towards 2050. You know, what's interesting as you say that though, is of course, the, the, really no other province is engaging the kind of pushback that Alberta is doing right now on these regulations. Is that because Alberta's situation is so reliant on natural gas for electricity generation? That's, that is exactly the reason we are. We, we made a decision to phase out coal at great expense. Not only did it cost us to pay out the stranded assets, but we then had to build a new grid based on natural gas with uh, with solar and wind as intermittent power. And then the federal government has come along just as those plants are only 10 years old saying not good enough, you've got to phase them out too. And so I think you've got a bit of exasperation in Alberta that we're moving in the right direction. There are other provinces that are that are exposed though. Saskatchewan also has a large amount of, of coal on their grid and uh, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick do too. And I, I'm a bit fearful that the residents in those provinces don't realize how at risk they are. So we're taking the lead. We tried to do this behind closed doors through negotiation to make the, the federal government see reason and they just continue, continue to come at us. And so we are trying to make sure that people understand there's four provinces who are going to be really, really damaged by this and that uh, we would like their, their help in trying to get a carve out so that we can all work together towards a 2050 goal. Okay, 2050 and, and to, to contextualize that, the, the clean uh, electricity regulations aiming it in 12 years, you're going back to the, the original goal plan or goal posts of, of 2050, but you know, there was a reception uh, this week in Ottawa that the Prime Minister attended. I know you're well aware of it. It was with a group of Alberta business leaders who, uh, who did come to the nation's capital. 
And the Prime Minister, he did not name names, but he did say that there are politicians who would rather deny facts of climate change than take action. And by, den by denying facts, he argues, are denying certainty for investors, opportunities for workers, and denying a kids a future they deserve. Uh, what's your reaction to, to that pushback from the Prime Minister? Again, not naming names, but politicians in general who don't agree. I'm not sure who he's talking about because he's not talking about me. I have said that we need to reduce emissions and get to carbon neutrality by 2050. I, I wish that the media would also report exactly what those business leaders told him time and time again in every meeting that 2035 was not achievable in Alberta, would result in a lack of investment, lack of stability, and they're aligned with our target of uh, 2050. Some think that they could even get there by 2045. And so they, I, I would say that the business community in Alberta, the, our Alberta electric system operator, and us are aligned on the same target, which is 2050 at emissions neutrality. You even saw in Ontario, their electric system operator also expressed concern about the lack of stability and reliability of, re of trying to attain a target too early. So this isn't about denialism. This is about what is achievable. We need to achieve the target that also ensures reliability and affordability. That's what a power grid is for, is so that when people turn the lights on, it comes on. When people need their furnace turned on, it comes on. And it's our obligation as a province, which has the exclusive jurisdiction, that's what it says in the Constitution, exclusive jurisdiction to manage our power grid, to be very forceful in ensuring that we're protecting our consumers, and that's what I'm doing. Do you undermine that argument, though, by the very fact that your government has put a moratorium on uh, new wind and solar projects, uh, alternative fuel sources, renewable fuel sources? Uh, and, and, you know, and to be fair, it's a six month moratorium. But as you're making this argument of what the province can't achieve, that is a, a policy that you put in place in August. They're, it's, they're connected, there's no question. Because when we bring on wind and solar, we have to have a natural gas backup. That's why we have so much wind and solar development in our province, is that when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, we're able to bring on natural gas peaker plants. Stephen Gobo was making that illegal. He, he has said that any plant that comes on stream has to have 95% of its emissions abated by, by 2035, or the executives will go to jail. That's the reason we don't have any more investment coming forward on base low power and natural gas is because of the uncertainty they've created. And if I can't bring on base load power, I can't bring on more wind and solar because we'll end up with grid instability. So it's a real bind that we're in. We wanna make sure that we can get to reliability, make sure that we have a responsible amount of wind and solar coming on, make sure we have enough base load, address the issues of where wind and solar are being built. They shouldn't be built on prime agriculture land, address the issues of end of life, these wind turbines, because they have 850 cubic meters of concrete, take a million or more to reclaim. We have to make sure we're not sh uh, saddling the landowner with those costs. There's, so we have to be deliberate in how we do this. We want to make sure that, that we have an environment where everybody can feel safe to invest. But number one, we have to make sure that the power grid itself won't fail. That's got to be our number one goal. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I, I do want to ask one more thing here in regards to the regulations, because you've already raised the, the specter of, of using Alberta's Sovereignty Act to, to oppose it. Yeah. At, what, at what point will you trigger that? I know you're, you're having your own officials and your, your, your cabinet looking into it, but at what point would you trigger the invocation of that act? There's three things. If they proceed with the 2035 net zero power grid that will criminalize the building of natural gas units, well, we won't use it. If they bring through an aggressive emissions cap on our natural gas uh, and oil sector, they've been talking about 42% reduction by 2030, which would essentially be a production cap, we'll use it. And if they bring through an over aggressive emissions target on methane, we've already reduced methane 45%. We're continuing to move on that but we're hearing some pretty troubling signs that they also want to set a target that's unrealistic and unachievable by 2030. Those would be the three things. As I said, we are aligned around 2050. I know and have confidence in my business sector that as they start seeing new incremental improvements in technology, as we start having the time frame to be able to develop some of those new technologies, we can get there by 2050. But I'm, you know, I have to be realistic and I have to be practical and I have to be truthful. And the truth is, 2035 is not achievable, and uh, the federal government needs to know it. Now, we did ask the Environment Minister, Stephen Goodbow, to respond to Smith's suggestion that those who do not follow the electricity regulations could face prison time. A spokesperson for the minister told us the following, quote, Premier Smith is hung up on the fact that the regulations are under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, which is a piece of criminal law. But her fears are wildly unfounded. It is not realistic that any power plant will go to jail in instances of non-compliance. 
First, they'd get warnings, then progressively larger fines. It is just fear-mongering, says Gilbo's office, and overheated rhetoric. So we will continue to follow the debate. Now, our conversation with Premier Smith did go a little longer. So we talked about the possibility of Alberta pulling out of the Canada Pension Plan. And we'll, we will air, rather, that part of the interview tomorrow, right here on Primetime Politics. Well, let's continue the conversation with our political observers. Susan Smith is principal with Blue Sky Strategy Group. Tim Powers is chairman of the SUMA Group. And Anne McGrath is the national director for the NDP. Hello to the three of you. Hello. So we just spoke to, to Danielle Smith. And as you know, she is engaging in this campaign, pushing back on the federal government's uh, proposed electricity regulations. She says the environment minister is being too ideological, especially given the fact that their own electricity supplier says that if they meet these regulations, the province is going to have a hard time meeting electricity demands. Is Ottawa being too hardlined here, Susan? I think uh, the accusation of being hardlined coming out of Danielle Smith's mouth is always something that's caused for a little side smirk, at least, from people. Um, the, the federal government has been clear about what it wants to do in terms of net zero grids. It's something I think people understand across the country. I think Danielle Smith, with an $8 million campaign, uh, a marketing campaign in Alberta, Ontario, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia, is going to cause more head scratching than anything else. And it, I think it's a deflection um, from her perspective. She's trying to get people off the failed sort of CPP conversation, and she's, she's spending her money in other places. She's, she is a hard line. She takes a hard line on things, but I'm not sure it's going to resonate with people outside the province of Alberta. Okay, uh, not outside the province of Alberta, maybe, but you know, within the province, as I say, it is the electricity supply company, a regulator, that says if they're they're going to have a hard time meeting meeting supply if they follow through. Tim, what do you think? Is is Ottawa being too hardlined? Uh, well, there's certainly a message in the province that she's going to that resonates and uh, going to uh, and spending the money in about Gibo being hardlined. I mean, I, we've heard the Ontario Premier speak about that before. Certainly in the East Coast, there's a sense that Minister Gibo doesn't necessarily understand rural sensitivities and the like. So there's part of an audience there. I'm, but I do agree with Susan that this is a bit of a distraction. Uh, from some of her other challenges, and, and no, she was in Alberta politics for a while. Often, Alberta premiers, more often conservative Alberta premiers, uh, will go on the road and say Ottawa sucks, uh, and hope that that engenders them uh, at home. I don't know if this campaign is going to make any significant difference. The only thing it may do is encourage Ontario, uh, New Brunswick, and maybe one or two others to come in on Justin Trudeau a little harder on the issue of affordability and because the Liberals are suffering at the polls because they're not seen to be connecting with Canadians on that issue, maybe it creates some space elsewhere but not necessarily on these regulations. Yeah, I was actually wondering about that, Anne, because you know, as Tim talks about affordability, I, I think whenever these debates happen, people are thinking dollars and cents. How much is it going to cost me? If you're, gonna, if you're gonna be net zero in 12 years time, what does that actually mean on my electricity bill? Is there an opportunity for Danielle Smith and her message to, to permeate beyond Alberta, do you think? Well, I mean, she's. I, I think that she is definitely picking a fight with the with Ottawa, and it, and it is. Tim's right. It's a tried and true thing in, in, in Alberta to pick fights with the, the federal government with Ottawa. Um, however, uh, she's she's making some mistakes in my view. She is. Um, first of all, she's uh, fighting at least a two-front war. Like she's got two things going on, both of which will uh, are fights with Ottawa, but also potentially fights with other premiers and other provinces. So, for instance, on CPP, to go out there and yeah. and say, you know, it, it's it's it, that half of over half of the CPP is is Alberta's. Number one, it's factually incorrect, but also uh, that terrifies people in other provinces about what she's planning to do. And so, I think that it it terrifies Albertans, but it also terrifies uh, the. the Rest of the country, and on and on the the targets, um, I, I find it odd that she would be like doing these kind of really doom and gloom kind of advertising. Like, I mean, I, I mean, we just saw. Uh, Heather Stephenson try that in Manitoba. These kind, these kinds of ads that are designed to scare people, uh, that are factually um, probably incorrect to to a large extent. And really, I think what people want in Alberta would like to see her do is focus on how to meet those targets and still protect. Albertans' jobs. I think they'd also like 
the premier to focus on health care, on the opioid crisis, yeah. on housing, and she's taking $8 million away from those kinds of buckets, and she's spending them on a social media campaign in other provinces, and it doesn't have a direct impact on her own citizens. So I think this one could backfire. It's, it's a bit of like Charlie Brown's teacher, you know. I think there's a bit of want on this, and I'm not sure it's really going to matter that much. Well, except that here you have Danielle Smith saying already that she has her people looking into perhaps invo invoking Alberta Sovereignty Act in order to forego these regulations. How, how worried should Ottawa be about that? Because that's quite a constitutional trigger. Ottawa should be worried about the fact that this is post-election campaign and not pre-election campaign because she presented very differently in the lead-up to the campaign. And this is exactly the people who were worried about her uh, and, and might have thought, okay, she's, she's being reasonable, she's being calm, she's communicating well, blah, blah, blah. Now they see what she's doing. I think that there's going to be a lot of buyer's remorse. She's well, setting herself up as sorry. a convenient foil for the Prime Minister, yeah. right? The yes. Prime Minister doesn't have to try that hard to present an alter a reasonable alternative to the kind of Alberta that Danielle Smith is selling. Now, it may not play that well for him for too many more Alberta votes, who knows, but it actually gives him an opportunity in the rest of the country to boost Canada in the, in the face of something that's a bit confusing, controversial, and maybe slightly uh, strange or misplaced for the rest of Canadians. Yeah, just yeah. quickly picking up off that, I mean, uh, um, it was alluded to by Anne a, a little while ago. She's got to give something to the other premiers if she wants to build some allyship. And she doesn't really have any allyship. She certainly doesn't have it with Ottawa. That is her point of attack. You saw when she did come out with the CPP reform, different premiers, including mine in Newfoundland and Labrador, saying, hey, wait now, we've got some issues here. Doug Ford, even Scott Moe didn't run to the front of the line and say, yeah, we're with you, Danielle Smith. So if you're going to do something and you're trying to actually extract policy as opposed to just pick a fight as a diversion, you need allies. Not sure where she's going to get them with so many mixed initiatives. Mm -hmm. And prior to the camp, prior to the election date, she was, they were really uh, working hard to try and calm people down because people had a lot of fears about her. And now those are being realized. Okay, well, we'll watch how that makes its way through. But uh, you mentioned the election campaign, and of course, Rachel Notley uh, of the NDP very much looked at as possible uh, contender, possible premier, uh, in what turned out to be a very close vote uh, going up to election night. Uh, we just saw Wap Canoe elected this week in, in Manitoba, and of course, there's the NDP uh, already in government in British Columbia. Your party's convention is coming up next week at the it National is. Convention in Hamilton, Ontario. I'll see you there. Mm -hmm. uh, what does Wab Canoe's victory, uh, and really the trend line that we've seen for the NDP out west, what does it say, do you think, about uh, the future of the party? Well, I think it's very promising. I think it, that it, with respect to the convention itself, it will definitely put a, a spring in the delegate steps. Like that, they will be very excited and very happy. I certainly remember what happened in 2015 when Rachel Notley won in in Alberta. There is a, and 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 as we watched the last couple of campaigns in British Columbia with the NDP being elected and then re-elected, that really gives people a lot of energy, gives people a lot of hope. Um, but I think the most important thing in all of this, uh, I took from uh, Premier Canoe's uh, Premier Elect Canoe. Um, address on election night, which I, I was very impressed by a number of things in that in, in his speech. But one of the things I thought that was most important was that he did not talk about this as a victory for the NDP. Mm -hmm. He talked about this as a victory for Manitobans. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that his his approach of like governing for the whole province, putting health care at the front of his agenda, because that's the issue that most people care about and it's something that really needs fixing, I think, was, and, and then just the way he talked and how he talked about it, I thought was very um, kind of, uh, you know, it was very embracing of, of the whole population. Yeah, well, we were there actually in NDP headquarters that night at the Fort Carey Hotel and without a doubt, a lot of energy in the room. What impact do you think this has on party fortunes? On NDP party yeah, fortunes? Okay. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, like Anne said, I expect all the delegates in Hamilton to come, you know, pretty charged up. It's it's a big deal to can, to defeat a, an incumbent premier, I think, and a government that had been there for a while, the Conservative government. I think people always look at the NDP in the lead-up to elections federally. I think they make different choices when it comes down to... It, it's more of a binary choice, A or B, when it comes to election day. I mean, par parts of the country, B.C. and others have all often and always frequently go NDP. Um, but I think in the in the lead up to the federal election, it still is a Trudeau uh, 
Polyev, that, what's that guy's name again? Polyev fight. <laughs> um, my congratulations sincerely to Premier-elect Canoe. I think it's phenomenal. The first First Nations Premier for Manitoba, first First Nations Premier in the country, I believe, yeah. And, and I think he set at the, the tone. Level, yeah. yeah, at the provincial level. He set the tone by talking about uh, kitchen table issues for Canadians, and I think that's what's going to be important uh, for every single party in the election. Um, and all parties' fortunes will depend on how they connect with people at the kitchen table. Tim, last word to you quickly. Uh, oh, quickly. Okay, Michael, being <laughs> Russian, I just ate you. it up. Well, I would just say this. The, the more significant NDP victory in the last little while was the one Anne was involved with, with Rachel Notley. That's not to take away from what uh, Pre uh, Premier-elect Canoe has achieved, and you have to admire him as an individual and the struggles he overcame. But there is a history in uh, Saskatchewan, long-held history of electing NDP premiers. I think there are some lessons for the national uh, uh, scope of politics here, but I think it was also a repudiation of the Palliser years and the poor campaign run by the Conservatives. So I'm not sure Anne or anybody else is ready to declare the second orange wave is breaking. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, and I look forward to that. If you're going to ever do that, please do so <laughs> on our show. Uh, but for now, Susan, Tim, and thank you very much for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Two weeks ago, Greg Fergus was the Prime Minister's Parliamentary Secretary, but his life took a big turn on Wednesday when he was selected by his peers to be the next Speaker of the House of Commons. Elected by secret ballot, he beat out six other contenders and becomes the first black Canadian, the first person of color to ever hold the speaker's position. We are now joined by the new speaker for the House of Commons, Greg Fergus. Mr. Speaker, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me, Michael. Now, you obviously uh, come in after a controversial time for the Speaker's office, you know, and that's where I want to begin. Given the, the episode that we saw in the last few weeks, are there any lessons that you want to take from what happened to your predecessor? Well, first of all, I'd like, I would like to acknowledge my predecessor's uh, really great contributions aside from this error which he made, um, which he apologized for, and which he paid for with the job as Speaker. Um, he has done, like, he has a, a, a much longer uh, history and, and a very positive one uh, where he, uh, you know, brought in hybrid parliament, where he really took efforts to bring members of parliament closer together. So I, I just want to make sure that we, uh, you know, we, we provide that with context. But to your question, uh, the things that we can do is that it started long before uh, the previous speaker, it started many, many speakers ago, is that we slid away from the rules and the procedures that we have in the House. Um, although the final decision always comes to the speaker and to Parliament as to who gets to sit uh, and, and be recognized in the galleries, there were some guidelines which were offered in the standing uh, orders which really lays out a very strict list of people who would be uh, uh, eligible to, uh, to be there. And, of course, leaving open some exceptions. Uh, I've asked the uh, House officers uh, to help develop some options. We were discussing some guidelines, but it's one thing that members uh, told me during the election for Speaker that they want to make sure that we tighten up. So that's how you see what happened then, essentially being too loose with, with the rules that were there, perhaps uh, beca becoming too comfortable with the way Parliament runs? I th I, I, well. It's just one of those things that, you know, as you go through and you make exceptions here and there for some really fabulous people, um, then it, you know, it starts getting a little bit, you know, we, we don't take it as seriously. I, I think it's the same thing in terms of decorum in the House. There are some very clear rules uh, about decorum in the House, some clear guidelines, uh, clear decisions from previous speakers, the things that we've got to look at to try to bring things back to making sure that we just don't keep on sliding out to a point that, uh, uh, we, we find ourselves now where, um, where I don't think a lot of Canadians look to Parliament uh, as, a, as a model for civil, uh, civil, uh, civil debate. Model for civil debate. You know, walk us through the process then, because that's, that's interesting. Because I, I, as you're talking about uh, the types of procedures and practices for the speaker uh, themselves, there's there's also the question about decorum in the House. What's the process that you're undertaking right now to 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 perhaps revise what's being done? So uh, my fellow, I'm not just the only speaker, we have uh, deputy speakers and assistant speakers of the House. We're meeting to discuss ways that we could look at how to look back on the rules of the House and the rules of debate 
uh, to provide guidelines. We're also going to take a look at previous decisions from previous speakers. Uh, and we're, then we're going to you know, work this out, we're going to talk with our colleagues, and then we'll bring them forward uh, to the House and publicly in a transparent manner. Now, you were uh, Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister. We had you several times on this program in that capacity, the, the face and, and the words that, that essentially came to the defense of, of Justin Trudeau and his government policies. So how do you address any perceptions of bias? Is it hard for you to take off one hat and really put on, well, a fancier hat as the Speaker of the House of Commons? Well, I guess there are two ways, uh, I, I would, two points I'd like to make. Uh, the first, as a, as a long-time parliament, parliament buff, uh, since I was a teenager, I love this place. I love the, uh, the traditions. I love the, the basic understanding of how we could have respectful civil debate uh, in the House of Commons. I think it's a wonderful thing and it's something that we need to cherish and preserve. So it's really easy for me to move from, uh, under from one hat to the other. Second thing, all members of Parliament you know, can say that we have our partisan hats, but more often than not, we have a lot in common, and there are a lot of friendships which are made uh, on all sides of the House. And so I think, again, any one of us, and we had uh, five incredible candidates uh, who all ran for, uh, for speaker, and any one of us easily could have, uh, will uh, adopt a nonpartisan way and enjoy the confidence of the House. And so that's what I'll be doing. And uh, the great thing is, is that I have a whole bunch of, uh, I have 337 people who are watching very closely to making sure that I do. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Listen, uh, I've got about a minute left here, but I, I do want to ask you, because without a doubt, you're making history by becoming Speaker. You're the first black Canadian to hold the office. What do you hope your time in the Speaker's chair accomplishes when it comes to, to, to perhaps diversity and how Canadians perceive and see their own country? Well, I, I think uh, it's just another occasion. I, I, I mean, yes, I may be the first. I, I really sincerely hope, and, and I'm, I'm quite confident I won't be the last. But I, I think what I want to, I, I hope that my candidacy and eventually success by, by having the support of my parliamentary colleagues, they made this possible. Um, by doing that, I think we want to send a message to all Canadians, whether you're black Canadians or if you're any minority group or of any Canadian. These things are possible. Everything is in reach. This is a country that offers so much. And so I hope uh, this gives an opportunity for people to expand their horizons, reach a little farther, dare to dream uh, a, a little bit more grander. And I think that will be, uh, I think that will be a great message. Mr. Fergus, uh, Mr. Speaker, congratulations on your election. Thank you for this. Thank you. And that is our program for this Thursday. I'm Michael Serapio. For everyone here at CPAC, thank you for watching. Primetime Politics is back tomorrow. But do stay with us. Esther Bejan avec l'Essentiel is up next.